We spend a lot of time around death in Jessica Jones, but not so much around dead bodies. Dead people, dying people, killers… by the end of the show's three season run, these are all common sights, but you could probably count the number of times we come into prolonged contact with a corpse on one hand. The number of times the characters and the viewer are forced to confront a body, a cold, lifeless body, and the unique challenges it poses. He's dead. You would have killed mother, daughter, cellmates. There is a distinction worth making here, I think. If you encounter a dying person, someone on the brink of death, the questions raised are centered on them. Can you help them? If so, how? Can you tend to their wounds, get them to someone who can, ease their suffering, take down a message, some last words? With a corpse, even a superficially similar experience is different, fundamentally, ontologically. Now it's about you. What does this encounter mean for you? Are you now implicated in some crime? If so, what do you do? Do you report it or do you clean up? Hide the body? How? Where? By the show's end, all of these are questions familiar to Jessica Jones. We see them, or variations thereof, again and again. Maybe the most jarring example comes in Season 1, Episode 7. Upon getting home, Jessica sees her slightly creepy neighbor Reuben is no longer living upstairs, he's now not living here. <gasps> The scene is tense and nauseating, and we're met with all those questions. Who did this? Why? Do you hide the body or call the police? But what interests me the most about this sequence is what happens while those questions are being asked. Reuben stops being Reuben, becomes Reuben's body, and then simply the body, the evidence. Jessica Jones, Making Death Matter. That's the prompt which won this month's Patreon community votes, which means that's what this video is going to be about. So let's talk about Jessica Jones. Let's talk about death, how it's reached, who it reaches, how it lingers, and let's talk about mattering. To start, an overview, a wide lens. Jessica Jones is a show about pain. It's a show about trauma. It's a show about broken people, stumbling through a broken world, looking for right choices and right answers. The search is hard. Nine times out of ten, it's futile. Most often, all that results is more pain, more breakages, secondary fractures, as the cracks spread deeper. And all around this world, behind so much of this damage, perpetually causing more is death. Our protagonist's character, her powers, her direction, in life, these all result from several intimate brushes with death. First the accident that killed her family and led to her abilities, then the murder of her dodgy boyfriend, her intervention to save a life that begins her period of killgravedness, and the death that ends it. That last death is also the primary driving force for another main character, Luke Cage, whose reactions to this death cascade across Season 1, and culminate in another murder attempt, similarly Kilgrave driven, but this time directed toward Jessica, not by her. Death is how the first season ends, one death to stop many more, but the second season turns this resolution around on us. It opens with the consequences rippling outward from that fateful snap, as we see a city determined to force the mantle of murderer upon our reluctant killer. Another job for you. How about you pay me for the first one? I want you to kill him. My job here is done. Perhaps more importantly, this season's ending is almost a direct inversion of the firsts. We also see a killer make a choice, a choice they've convinced themselves is one death to stop many more, but this killer is Trish, and the target Jessica's mother, Alyssa, a figure who we've seen slowly but surely demonstrate an ability to change. The audience instinctively takes Kilgrave's death as a triumph, Alyssa's as a tragedy, but arguably the major difference between these two deaths is simply perspective. Season 3 pits a fragile serial killer against Jessica and an increasingly brutal Trish in a story characterized by shifting alliances and blurring lines. By the end of the show's run, nothing's really figured out. The granting of death, even considered, reluctantly inflicted death, a price paid for the greater good, might not be clearly wrong, but is never truly right. After dozens of episodes wading through death, all we really know is that it's death. 
it's everywhere and that it does just as much damage to its survivors as it does to its victims. And it is everywhere. Death is a constant presence. There's some degree of plot armor here, maybe, but less than is typical for the genre. The villains don't slink off to menace the hero another day. Their necks get broken. At the start of the second season, we see a main cast member being given a surprise fatal diagnosis. Secondary characters die left and right, but sure, okay, there's a lot of death. Saturation doesn't equal significance, though. If anything, you'd think the constant presence of death, both in the narrative and in our characters' minds, might run the risk of normalizing death, taking away its impact. So for now, let's abandon this wide lens and zoom in. There's a scene in the fourth episode where Jessica stumbles upon the planned site of her own death. She'd been working a case, trying to catch a supposedly cheating husband, and her sleuthing leads her to a strange scene. The guy wasn't sneaking off to see a mistress, he was intentionally leading Jessica into an ambush set up by his wife. The plan is to kill the PI in cold blood. Get her on the plastic! How? I have a gun on her for Christ's sake, Carlo. It's an interesting scene for a few reasons. For one, it's the first time the show really digs into the tension, the resentment bubbling up between the powered and the rest, a subcurrent present throughout the show's run, but my favourite part is the way it spatializes death. Jessica's task here isn't merely to escape or to disarm her ambushes, no, they're telling her this is the part where you die. And standing above the plastic sheeting earmarked for her corpse, she has to figure out why they're wrong, if they're wrong. Can her own death be negotiated? Should it be? The answer lies in the specifics of this planned death. It isn't random. The would-be killer's mum died in the Battle of New York, the superheroes didn't save her, and the daughter responded to this trauma by assigning blame. She wasn't saved by the powered, so her death is their fault. That means it's Jessica's fault, and it's time she paid. The death Jessica faces is personal. It's because of who she is, because of an unchangeable, essential characteristic, her powers, and because of her actions. That is, she only became the target of the would-be killer thanks to her careless usage of those powers. But just knowing this is enough to change things. If in this space, Jessica's abilities and their effects are strong enough to drive a woman to attempted murder, then Jessica's real the one with all the power here. And when she's figured out what's going on, it isn't too hard to see how that power needs to be used to successfully negotiate this death. They're scared of her abilities, insecure about their powerlessness, their inability to control their existence. Jessica uses those abilities, reclaims them. Jessica owns her powers, the part of her being targeted, being contested, as well as the mystique and fear around them in an explosive display of vigor. Keep your goddamn feelings Please don't kill us. We, we, we're gonna leave you alone. And to ensure this doesn't happen again, she taps into that mystique once more, makes up a bunch of superpowered friends, and claims they'll come after her attacker if she doesn't dip pronto. This is the key here. It's Jessica's refusal to cede this part of her identity that wins this negotiation with her death. She walks away with her life this time, and the story continues. But I want to linger on this encounter with death for a moment more, and just note the intimacy of it. Again, it's deeply personal. Jessica enters and leaves this encounter because of an essential, unchangeable characteristic, her powers. She and the assassin fight over these powers, almost battling more against each other's resultant baggage, baggage from past deaths, past actions, past inactions, than against each other. Digging her way out of this death scene requires Jessica to relive the deaths of others, of her family, nearly becoming overwhelmed in the process, not by mortality conceptually, but specifically, intimately. You lost your parents? Welcome to the goddamn club. I lost mine in some random accident. Do you see me trying to kill every shitty driver? And that doesn't end here. Across all three seasons, Jessica Jones is a show in which death is intimate, for which the specifics of mortality matter more so than the broad strokes. And that isn't just the case for death's victims. 
For the killers of Jessica Jones 2, death is intimately bound up with identity. For instance, look at Simpson. Officer Will Simpson, a sometimes friend, sometimes foe of Jessica's, is a menace. He veers unpredictably between anti-hero and outright villain, but in his head, he is unquestionably in the right, even when killing innocents. And that rock-solid self-identity seems to have been formed from a prolonged engagement with death. See, we never get any clear picture of this version of the character's backstory, but we know he was in the army, we know he did horrible things, and we know he was labelled a hero for doing them. Whatever abilities you have, I'm guessing they don't include rendition, exfiltration, and isolation of enemy combatants. He's a war hero. The death in this killer's past goes on to define his self-image. It's continuously visible in Simpson's utter conviction of his own heroism, regardless of human cost. Death, death inflicted, becomes the defining context for the story of Will Simpson, or at least that's how he sees it. But that isn't the end of it. In a lot of stories like this, stories which take death for granted a little more, killing can be more about the killer than the killed. Even something like Daredevil, a more grounded, more human-scale drama often seems more concerned with the morality of taking life than with the taken lives themselves, more focused on what crossing that line takes away from a person. I don't kill anyone. Is that why you think you're better than me? No. Is that why you think you're a big hero? Don't get me wrong, as noted above, this is an angle Jessica Jones dwells on too, but the show never loses sight of the victims, the people whose ends facilitate these morality games. Similarly, for these, the killed, death becomes a defining context, but there's an important difference in that it's also the final context. If you inflict death, that death may come to determine your identity, but that identity is still malleable, can still be renegotiated right up until you're on the other side of the equation, until you die. At that point, specific death, your death, is burned into your identity, indelibly. The end of your story is locked in and can never change. Sometimes that's dark. Take the way that following her diagnosis, Jerry Hogarth spends the final two seasons failing to change in time, using people for her own ends, failing to consider anything but her image and her happiness until the final withering blow is struck. I know, you don't want to die alone. But you're going to. Sometimes, though, this can be liberating. Hope Schlotman's final act is self-sacrifice to render Kilgrave vulnerable. And though she chooses death, paradoxically, this act is also a reclamation of her identity. The last few chapters in Hope's story remain dark, remain the tragic tale of an abused, manipulated victim, but the very end, maybe the defining point, is a brave assertion of identity and selflessness. That is what her death shows, what it'll show forever. Death in the abstract doesn't define her. her death Death does, a noble end. And even though Hope's story is over for her, it isn't necessarily gone. This, I think, is the last essential part of death in Jessica Jones. The way death isn't final. The way sometimes it doesn't take. I don't mean that literally. I'm not talking about the way characters like Trish, Jessica, Kilgrave, and Luke narrowly dodge fatality. I mean the way that the state of being dead repeatedly fails to stop characters from impacting the world in specific, powerful, personal ways. Sure, there's the trauma, the baggage their death saddles their survivors with, but there's also more than this. We see connections forged in life drive the actions taken by survivors, the way Hope's sacrifice pushes Jessica's actions in the closing hours of season one, the way the wizard's death shames and galvanizes her and Trish to uncover IGH, the way Carl's fate causes Alyssa to regress, to rampage, to her own ultimate end, or the way Reva's memory first unites, then divides Luke and Jessica, but these posthumous connections can and do go further than this. Jessica's mental relationship with her family, with her brother in particular, dead for well over a decade at this point, continues to utterly define her self-image. This relationship isn't static, it changes as Jessica's knowledge and understanding of her family's last days develop. We see a sort of communion with the dead here, even if it is ultimately one-sided. By the end of season two, this communion has fundamentally altered not only the way Jessica remembers her loved ones, but also the way Jessica sees herself. 
look at me. You did not cause that accident. Never once did it cross my mind that any of this is your fault. Funny, because it crossed mine about a million times. And this example isn't the only way in which the dead don't stay dead. Kilgrave reappears a few times. Not really, of course, he's a manifestation of Jessica's trauma, but to us he's real, and to Jessica too. The fact of his death doesn't really lessen the impact. Main Street. Birch Street. Higgins, Higgins Drive. Drive. Cobalt Cobalt Lane. Lane. This type of symbolic resurrection, though, and the way it can change the living, it isn't all bad. Toward the end of the show's last season, we accompany Trish and Jessica to the funeral of Dorothy Walker, their mother. Trish is by birth, Jess is by adoption. She'd been targeted by the serial killer Gregory Salinger. Given the extra focus this season had allowed Dorothy, the death is an all too predictable instance of collateral damage. But you don't see what happens at the funeral coming. Your mother saved my career. I hated doing sex scenes, so she told me to start Dorothy screenwriting. Said, Just skip the couples therapy and spend the cash on a facelift and a divorce attorney. Even Trish and Jessica didn't see it coming. Probably won't be much of a turnout, so. She wasn't perfect. Doesn't make it any easier to bury her. Dorothy was, in many ways, a broken person. She was self-serving, superficial. She passed her own issues onto Trish, often compounded, and wasn't exactly mother of the year to Jessica post-adoption. At various points, both her daughters had been estranged from her. So this revelation of all the lives she'd touched, all the good she'd done, isn't the straightforwardly heartwarming moment it might have been in another show. And we don't spend ages sitting in this moment. After all, we've got a villain to catch, we've got a heel turn to witness, and we've got a show to wrap up. But we do see Trish and Jessica affected by this, moved, but not necessarily to joyous tears. Nearly everything is left unsaid, but it isn't hard to imagine conflicting emotions running through their heads. Relief that this becomes Dorothy's legacy, surprise that this vast web of goodwill had evaded their notice, and perhaps hurt, Jealousy. If she was capable of good, real good, why did her own kids suffer? It isn't obvious how they're feeling, but it is obvious that they are feeling, and keenly. It isn't obvious why they're feeling, either, not precisely. Are they responding to Dorothy's death, or to this newly discovered layer of her life? It seems like both. It seems like there's really no separating the two. Dorothy's funeral sequence is probably the re-lifing of the dead, which hits our main characters the hardest, but there is one earlier instance that I remember far more strongly. The similar, albeit much smaller in scope sequence where Reuben is remembered, mentally revived by his sister Robin. Tell him I'm sorry about the zoo. We can go this weekend. Will you tell him? I'll take him to see the giraffes, I promise. Oh, he loves those long necks. He's very sensitive about his neck, you know? You should know that. Also, he won't eat crust if it has seeds on it. Robin doesn't know what happened to her brother, not yet, but across the course of a few shared memories, Reuben stops being a corpse and is himself again, one last time. In Jessica Jones, death is never settled. It has to be negotiated again and again, even well after the point of death. But even in these moments, especially in these moments, we see why death matters in Jessica Jones. Because the dead mattered. People matter. Life matters. Not in the abstract, but in the specifics. It matters that Dorothy saved this woman's career, that Reuben loved giraffes and hated crusts. And this mattering, like death, is intimate. In a lot of ways, this show is a bleak one. It's a series of often harrowing stories of trauma set in a broken world. But despite all that, the existentialism at the heart of Jessica Jones is far from nihilistic. There's a life-affirming core here, and we see it with Reuben, with Dorothy, even with Jerry. When all that matters is what you do in the fleeting moments between cradle and grave, what you do matters. Death matters because life matters, and life Life really matters. Jessica herself is often in denial about this fact, but her show is not. 
And that's that. Jessica Jones video complete. Again, if you want to say in what the next one of these Patreon community videos is about, follow the link below and join up. There's a bunch of other benefits too. Make sure to demolish that like button, and huge thanks to all of my current patrons on screen now, especially Ryan Emily. Thank you.